pleasure to welcome you all to the launch of Fiji Pride 2024, organized by the Ripple Pride Foundation and the French Embassy. We are honored to be part of this wonderful evening celebrating diversity, love, and the spirit of the LGBTQ community. Tonight, we gather not only to celebrate, but also to reaffirm our commitment to fighting discrimination and promoting equality. France has long been a champion of LGBTQ plus rights globally, and we continue to strive for a world where everyone, regardless of their sexual orientation or gender identity, can live with dignity and respect. As we kick off this exciting season of Pride, we have a special message from Jean-Marc Berthaud, the French ambassador for LGBTQ plus rights. Although he couldn't be here, obviously, in person, he has recorded a message for all of us. Following his message, we have a delightful evening planned with cake cutting, a screening of the movie The Shaggy Shrimps, and engaging discussions. We'll also enjoy some tasty bites together, all in the spirit of friendship and solidarity. This year is significant for us as France hosts the Olympic and Paralympic Games. It's a powerful reminder of the importance of inclusivity in sports, a theme we hold dear tonight. Let's celebrate the progress we've made and continue to work together for a brighter, more inclusive future. Thank you for being here. And now, let's hear from Jean-Marc Berton. Yes, sorry, let's hear from Jean-Marc Berton. Binaka. I was going to the ambassador for the right of the uh, to discuss and it's too much of a to two by President Macron. My mission is to be the voice of France for the decriminalization of LGBT discussions and for the full respect of all the rights. This mission cuts me in constant contact with the activists and NGOs, everyone who were listening to their needs and demands and working with them to help them. French diplomacy is mobilized to advance the LGBT cause. We have created a fund to support NGOs, launched a campaign at the UN for decolonization, we have asked our embassies to set spaces for LGBT people to organize an annual meeting with uh, civil society actors to support them to approach the authorities where the situation is growing, but also to organize events like this to give visibility to LGBT. So I'm very proud and happy to be able to participate in this lecture event. Working for LGBT rights can take many parts and take many forms. Sport is one of them. Combating discrimination against the LGBT community in sport is not an easy task, but it is absolutely essential. Sport, whether individual or collective, is a means of sharing openness, solidarity, self improvement of pleasure must take precedence of the benefits. Whether I am as an athlete, whatever my sexual orientation or gender identity, what I do matters more than who I am. Sport reminds us that we are always more than what we are assigned to be. This is why the victory firms violently demonstrating not without human emotion. We need a new need of openness in the world. The Chinese electric games will contribute to this. We are committed to inclusive games and we will be particularly happy to welcome athletes and supporters who want to point out what is said. The sport of football must not discriminate against anyone. The summer's games will tell you what we have Thank you for your attention. I wish you a happy five hours. Thank you very much. Can you say that's 
some misty tender. Hello everyone. Uh, we'll just play the video again for everyone that's walking. I think so there were a lot of discussions in between. Uh, maybe you know next time. Once again, can I have the panelists here in front?
Can I ask the panelists to introduce themselves here? Mbulu Naka, Chenewe Sede here from Fiji National Radio. Mbulu Naka, Mbulu Naka, my name is Alumita Nambedu, where you can call me Alex, which I do prefer. I'm a program associate for family specific based on social. My name is uh, Luisa, and uh, I'm working here for uh, Disability Pride Hub, part of the Rainbow Pride Foundation. Bolivinaka, my name is Krish, and I'm the colleague for the Disability Pride Hub. Thank you. Thank you. Can I also have some representatives of the lead organizations here present here? Anyone, any other representatives, please? Any other organization, NGO, please, that help by helping us? Can you come and join us to help cut the cake? Pride Foundation, um, as well as the Pacific Special Agenda Diversity Network. 
So if, uh, without any further ado, Lady Ronto. Good evening, everyone. I thought I was lucky and I missed it. But I'm also uh, lucky, but I'm so thankful to be here. So if you just bear with me, I need to pull up the words that I put together on behalf of our board. So ladies and gentlemen, esteemed guests and allies of the Rainbow Pride Foundation, it is an honor to welcome you all this special Pride event hosted in partnership with the Office of the French Ambassador. I am, of course, Rhonda, a very proud board representative of the Rainbow Pride Foundation. And it fills me with immense joy to see such diverse and supportive gathering here today. I would like to extend our heartfelt gratitude to the French Ambassador and the Embassy of course, here in our lives, I'll say, for their unwavering support of Pride initiatives and for joining hands with us in celebrating this important occasion. See, a commitment to inclusivity and equality is truly commendable. And we are grateful for your continued partnership in advancing the cause of LGBTIQ rights here in Fiji. As we come together to mark Pride Month, let us remember the significance of this momentous occasion. Pride is not just a celebration, of diversity and love, it is a powerful reminder of the ongoing struggle for acceptance and equality. It is time to honor the progress we have made and to reaffirm our commitment to creating a more inclusive and equitable society for all. Today, as we stand united in solidarity, let us embrace the spirit of collaboration and recognize the strength that comes from diversity. Together, we can build a more inclusive world where everyone is free to be their authentic selves without fear of discrimination or prejudice. So thank you once again to the French Ambassador and of course our beautiful ones who continues to recognize the, the support and the work that we continue to do together here in the country. And for the Embassy. And thank you to all of you for being here today. So let's continue to march forward with pride, passion and purpose, knowing that together we can create a higher and more inclusive future for all. So we're not going to be messy for you. Thank you so much, Lady Ronta. Now, I know I've missed out a few important things like the opening remarks, as well as the special video message, but we'll, you know, go straight into the other parts of the program that I did not miss, which is the cutting of the cake. Oh, sure. Yes. Who's cutting the cake? Maybe we can ask our panelists uh, to come up as well as our guests uh, of honor, and maybe we could have also someone from uh, persons with disabilities to also be present in that uh, lineup of um, cutting the cake. So, if uh, chop chop, the movie is quite long. <laughs> a very important uh, screening. And unfortunately, my French is nowhere as good as everybody else. So ma'am, if you can, what's the title of the movie? Les Crevettes Pailletées, The Shiny Shrimps. Okay, so we'll try it again. So you do the French bit and then I'll do the English bit. Okay, here we go, two, three. Les The Shiny Shrimps. <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, please make yourselves comfortable as we screen the shiny shrimps.
Okay, so I have a question for the audience. Do you want to taste the cake now or after the movie screening? Do you want to have it now? Okay, so maybe what we'll do is we'll take a five minute break just so that the cake can be cut and then distributed and use something sweet as you watch this little screening of the shiny shreds, yes? <laughs> so our final break starts now. <laughs> Thank you. Um, what we are doing at the moment, uh, I'm engaged with uh, Moira Bilik uh, State, that is in the western uh, side of Fiji. And a um, few months back, I had to draw up um, our vision, mission, and our values. And uh, inclusivity was part of our values. It was one of our. And uh, during our meeting. Uh, this is one thing that I highlighted in our meeting. Are we prepared to accommodate the LGBTQ uh, communities? Yeah. And um, the room was like silent. And I know that it's going to be a battle. But um, yeah, in our values, we are accepting anyone, uh, everyone, uh, regardless of your age or skill level or your sexual preferences. And uh, yes, uh, I know that uh, uh, taking baby steps uh, will one day become, uh, you know, um, just like the Americans when they went to the moon. Uh, Fiji is, uh, is similar to that. Uh, uh, if you look deeper into how our social construct is being, uh, is being addressed. And uh, I'm glad that uh, I've been <laughs> asked by Mr. Uh, right? who I've been working with uh, since 2010, right. And uh, yes, um, her clinic in, in Australia, you know very well that uh, uh, supports the, uh, the LGBTQ+, if I like. And uh, Fiji also, Fiji National Clinic is also looking into um, organizing, having uh, competitions uh, uh, for, for our community. Thank you. Naka, thank you, Sean. Yes, I do would like to also add, and maybe after you, you pass the microphone to. Um, yes. Yes. Um, Naka, I've uh, mentioned that uh, I've represented Fiji on uh, the elite level in women's football for 
more than 20 years, almost 20 years now. Um, in 2011, I was actually removed from the National Women's Team because of my sexuality. And uh, it wasn't that I portrayed it in the national team. I had my partner at home he involved in my personal life into it. So from 2011, I chose to speak up for all the women who wanted to come out into the L community or come out as their own sexual preferences. Um, hence the reason um, All Sports Association started, whereby I get to speak on all, all levels of sports in Fiji um, on gender equality. And we're working on it now. Uh, I'm proud to say that we've started uh, something called Pacifica Welfare Union, whereby I not only look after Fiji, but all throughout the, the Oceania region when it comes to sexual preferences for women in football. Naka. Um, okay, I have I enjoyed playing a lot of sports. I played rugby for 15 years. My team in Sydney went in the Mardi Gras parade two times. My family was horrified. And um, we built a three meter high paper mache rugby ball and danced behind the ute in the parade and loved it. But had to fight within the club to get the permission to do this, um, which was an interesting experience. Here in Fiji, um, I have worked together with the University of the South Pacific to create a, um, a research program for sports. And the first graduate from that program undertook research on women's rugby sevens in Fiji and detailed the experiences of the sevens players for a like, 16 year period and described a lot of the harassment, the abuse, the challenges that the female rugby players experienced in a male dominated sport. So I think there's a lot that we can learn through research, but there's so many questions that haven't been answered yet. And uh, that's just the absolute tip of the iceberg. I can share with you from, um, from teaching about inclusive coaching in Australia, there was some, the first bit of research in this space in Australia was called Come Out and Play. And they interviewed um, athletes from many different sports codes and uncovered lots of very interesting experiences about who felt safe to come out in different environments. Some sports felt more safe than others. Some experienced more physical violence versus verbal abuse and harassment. And as we saw in the film, that there's very, very complicated circumstances in a sporting sense. Relationships between athletes and athletes, athletes and coaches, athletes and officials, uh, with spectators, with parents, um, behaviours and protocols in the change room and in the toilets, which we know happens outside of sport as well. The young people who are experiencing challenges with their identity at different ages and trying to understand who they are. There's not a rule book that says this is what happens at a certain age when you know and you understand about yourself. This is not the case at all. So for sport, Sport organisations have a responsibility to be inclusive, to be accepting, to understand that coaches and administrators need to have the skills to be inclusive um, and to not, even by accident and ignorance, exclude people or create an environment that makes people feel afraid or shamed and not included. So I think that's a key message we need from organisations, um, which reflect is reflected in how they fund activities, how they train their staff and volunteers, and the environment and that welcomeness that people feel when they come to their club or to their sport. There's so much more work to be done, but this is a very, very complicated space, and it's a really exciting to be a part of this whole discussion and to be having an open conversation today after that phenomenal film, Manka. Naka, thank you very much. Uh, before I pass on to me, just to like just say a few important takeaways from that discussion was the importance of being a champion when you're not a member of the community. Allyship is huge, um, has huge effects, of course, when it comes to uh, making changes. For example, like Tom spoke earlier, having it reflected in policy, etc. So it's, these are all crucial work that if you're also sitting in here representing organizations that do work with sports, and for people who are diverse and so yes, or skirted in personalities or athletes, 
research and content, have the information readily available, because it's those kind of information that actually mm. informs funders and donors to make sure that they continue to invest in this kind of work. So thank you. So if you go on. Thank you, Roger. I just wanted to, I know you highlighted some challenges, but I wanted to actually ask everyone on the panel, what are some of the challenges that you faced as athletes or as sports men and women, but also as part of organizations that deal within the sports industry? So maybe we start with maybe the, those that are sports men and women. Family, Andy, any of you can start it off. Um, thank you all very much, Benji. Uh, First of all, um, most of you here, yeah, um, I would like to explain more about Family Pacific and the work that we do on the ground. Uh, family Pacific is a feminist media organization that uh, basically focuses on largest women, um, young women, aging women, um, LGBTIQ community, um, sex workers, and uh, also um, women in sports and uh, basically focus on uh, rural, maritime, urban, very urban as well. Um, we, cover, we cover our work around um, the whole of Fiji and the Pacific region as well. For Fiji, we have 15 districts across the country, uh, including Panuale um, and uh, Ovalau, uh, which is Lebuka. Um, some of the challenges uh, that we have faced on the ground in terms of the work that we do with the LGBTIQ community, especially um, for with level, um, I know you know young women in sports they are exposed to uh, and they have access to everything when everything is uh, you know around them. But and then back uh, back to the which I can speak most about. Um, uh, nearly every month I go down to Bonolevo to do my research work. Um, one of the challenges that young women face is for especially young community in the community in terms of resources, accessing uh, resources, and also, you know, accessing the learnings into the important things with them. It's their right, you know, rights for uh, my young women in sports, rights as LGBTIQ community, you know, so that they are safe. The, the, the priority is the safety and, and security of young women in sports, which is a very important. Um, also, some of the barriers that we face is that the inclusion of young women in sports to be included into spaces as such, you know, when um, uh, aging women, young women, young mothers are sitting into, um, uh, in a conference room and when young women are invited, young women in sports are invited and that, you know, the reactions that they put towards uh, young women in sports when they enter the complex. That is one of the barriers is the two that we face, um, the rejection, the ignorance that young women face when they enter the learning spaces, um, which is uh, um, the biggest barrier as well. Um, also in terms of their voices, voicing up the issues um, about uh, young women in sports, whatever they are facing on the ground. Um, that is one thing that is very important, their voice to be heard and how far it has reached and what can be done to help them out, you know, for their voice to be heard. Um, for us at Family Pacific, we have a radio station, and part of the radio station, uh, part of our radio content is a rainbow show production, which uh, includes a young women in sports voice that is heard. Um, now, at the moment, just last month, uh, we have extended our, 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 our work with the CFL, Communication Future Limited, uh, in terms of advocacy, not only with young women in sports, but LGBTIQ as a whole. Um, also, we're working, uh, we're trying to work things out, you know, in terms of communication channel, um, in terms of advocacy now with the um, FBC. Um, but still in the process, we're still working on that, but hopefully, we hope for the best that we will. work. This is in terms of our voice of young women in sports that needs to be heard and they really need help on the ground. Thank you. Thank you. Um, for me, you know, I was born into the social uh, norms, eh? mm -hmm. a very Asian traditional. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's not by choice, but um, in life, uh, looking back, you know, the 
religious values. And um, you know, being a man. Um, uh, do, you, do you remember in 2013 when we went to the uh, rugby league World Cup in England? And uh, somebody said, hey, come on, let's go to the club. And uh, leave the rhino, it was the uh, LGBTQ club. Eh? And uh, it was a shock, uh, personally. And after that day, you know, I started to you know, understand eh? that uh, there are people who love this way. And not in the way that I, I was born into. And uh, it was a challenge in 2013, looking back 10 years from now, I mean, 10 years on. Uh, I started to realize that, uh, you know, it could be uh, one of my niece my nephews. So I need to better prepare it if uh, someone pops up in the family and, uh, you know, uh, loves the same, you know, <laughs> It was really, you know, I really think that night and, and I had to keep my, my thinking straight. And one thing I realized is that uh, even though my mind and my thoughts are so conditioned to these traditional uh, values, the spiritual teachings, I start to understand that I need to look at things in an unconditional way. Uh, regardless of uh, how, I, how I was brought up, um, I need to accept uh, what's in front of me. Even uh, getting a master lies invitation today, uh, I didn't hesitate to come. And uh, I believe that uh, um, we should give you space to enjoy what you want to do. And we should give you uh, space to do what you want to do. And we have to embrace each other and um, have uh, you know, sad, uh, like the tournaments. You know, when I was watching the, <laughs> the movie, that coach was just writing here. And, uh, you know, with time. Mm -hmm. And I believe with time, uh, people of Fiji will understand to embrace uh, your community and then to move along and work along beside you. And uh, in particular, you know, national uh, reps, eh? because they have a big part to play. It's not that. Um, um, you know, they're in a position that, uh, you know, they don't want to, you know, be in the spotlight, um, championing uh, LGBTQ+. You know very well that uh, most uh, uh, sports uh, personnel would rather, you know, stay behind. Uh, I, I love uh, coming tonight and nice. being part of this program. And um, I'm willing to learn more and uh, work uh, with your community to see how we can uh, address um, and teach our young ones how to embrace each other. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, that was the really challenge, uh, <laughs> that type of training, yeah? our training. Yeah? Thank you. Maybe, Ooh. maybe we can have uh, my sister, and let us go try it out. Thank you. Um, mine will be very brief because I, I, haven't, I haven't had that much uh, travel experience. Uh, but one uh, challenge in particular I'd like to talk about is when we had that opportunity, deaf women and men, uh, to go and play rugby league in Argentina. The focus was on the men's team and um, fundraising and even visa and all those talks was focused on the men's team and we ended up not going to Argentina. But then again, thankfully, uh, we were able to go to the Australian Deaf Games uh, early this year. Uh, there was a 14 and we were glad we were included in that uh, championship. And we won uh, gold. Wow. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Congratulations on your team's win. Go ahead, ma'am. Um, I'm not sure I can top all of these. 
interventions right now. Um, but our work with Sport Matters is really focused on the link between sport and human rights. And this cuts across a lot of the conversations that we have in Fiji, especially around the rights of people with disability at the moment. And we have a project supported by the French Embassy in Fiji called Invisible to Included. And the messaging will resonate with the content tonight. Um, absolutely. And this is about making sure that people have a safe, fun, and inclusive first contact with sport. And that opens the door for so many more opportunities. At the regional level, I work a lot with um, many regional sports stakeholders and have been part of a lot of consultations. In terms of sport and human rights at that level, the types of things that come up in the consultations that I've been a part of within the last um, firstly around um, safeguarding and protecting the integrity of sport. We're doing some research with the, uh, supported by the UN Office on Drugs and Crime, and that's looking at uh, experiences across the region. One of the examples that has come through that research and also our work with um, athletes from 18 Pacific countries they mentioned specific examples and one was reflected in the movie when they talked about hazing and having that initiation for a new team. I think there's a, a practice in, in one of the French-speaking territories that originated in France where new players, and I think it was in the sport of swimming, were held down and having their head shaved as part of their initiation. But sometimes things like that go too far and cross the line. Um, so there's, there's a lot of questions to be had around when, um, when there's black and white rules and when things go too far, what are the repercussions and whose responsibility is it? And that extends from harassment and abuse to violence that may or may not be linked to, to sexual abuse. Um, it's important that for sport organisations we have a space to be speaking about these things and again those policies and procedures. And once people make a report, the biggest thing that athletes say is they're afraid to make a report uh, because of what the repercussions might be, um, or that if they do, it'll be swept under the rug and nothing will actually happen. So they'll take a risk for nothing. So I think we need a combination of more awareness and education, but also stronger sanctions to really protect people um, when they're faced with harm. Because sport is, is not positive or negative. Sport itself is neutral and is an absolute reflection of society. So the safeguards and protections are the responsibility of the people administering the sport to make sure that their participants, their customers, their clients, their family are safe every step of the way. The other example I wanted to share in a competition sense is that the rules of sport are fierce and very difficult to change. And there's some challenges right up to Pacific Games level and above around transgender participation in the games. And I think in 2019, Model Hubbard, the weightlifter from New Zealand, um, is one example that was in the media a lot in 2019. The International Olympic Committee has got some new guidance in the last years on athlete rights and responsibilities, and really trying to show a lot of leadership when it comes to human rights and to sports. They also have a new human rights framework, which is worth checking out. And the challenge that we have is how to take those ideas and make the rights real for everybody, um, right to the village level in every country, uh, especially in Fiji. Andrew, do you want to say anything, Andrew? Um, I'll speak on, um, on generally on football in Fiji. Um, they have this traditional and religious norm whereby if you come out as part of the LGBTQI community, you are removed from the national team. And that has been ongoing since the existence of football in this country. Uh, what is said is, as much as these girls are talented and you wish to see the women's uh, football team in the World Cup, we have the capability of the, those players. But because of this, uh, restrictions that they, they place on, on football players. And so recently they would rather take a team without anyone that's 
that's in the LGBT or a member of the LGBTQI community. Um, there is something that I'm working on, and I'm glad last year they managed to, we managed to press a few buttons for them. Um, I just blog. I blog about all of these, and I share it on all the platforms that I have. Um, because I know uh, as much as I'm trying to push for change in the football fraternity in Fiji, it will take quite some time um, to get the change. However, it does not stop me from continuing to do what I do. In 2019, uh, all the girls that have been pushed away or removed from the national leagues, uh, I started a business house tournaments. Um, in 2019, I started with 30 teams, a men's team, and I started with two women's teams. Uh, our last season, um, I was blessed to start with 10 women's teams now. So I have all these women, if they do not have the platform to play in local leagues in Fiji, we still have another platform to play where they can still display the football. Uh, I would like, uh, I know there's donors in the house, and I would like to suggest something, you know, this, uh, we've come a long way representing the noble banner blue. And it's said that little things like this uh, stop very talented girls who are, who are talented. They might not be able to finish school, but they're very talented in sports. And there is one way that they can make money and take back home. Uh, they might come up with our constitution. We have a constitution. I've read all sports constitutions in Fiji. I'm doing a review on sports policy right now as my own research. Because I want to bring change into sports on all levels for women's Fiji at the moment. I would like you to see before you actually look at how much you donate to sports bringing gender equality, maybe uh, you say you give so and so amount of money, but who is there to actually show you that there is equality? It is stated in our constitution, but how how do you know that it's actually there? You know, who who are your people that's there speaking up for people like me and them? So that's just a little um, challenge for me. But I'm glad, I'm thankful for the many people uh, like Rhonda, um, that, that give me platforms like this to come and speak on behalf of everybody, all the women that are members of the LGBTQI community. I have a uh, women rugby players that also call me. There's people in Fiji, there's women that play in Fiji that contact me privately because if there, there's a fear of getting removed either from rugby, touch rugby, netball, basketball, you name it. I am their voice, and I am there that I get given this platform so that I get to share with you people what we are still facing today. Naka. Thank you. Even the microphone is giving up on this, but um, I have one more question, but I'd like to open it to the floor to at least maybe collect two questions from the audience for our discussants, if there's any. Feel free to put your hands up and we'll, we'll have the microphone come to you. It's also okay if you don't have any questions. Because we're in Fiji, I know that Tarama will be happening after this anyway. You can have your question and answer sessions in your own private time around maybe refreshments if there's any more. I don't know. And I haven't had any. But anyway, uh, the last question is the relation to the movie your organizations and you as individuals. What have you got planned for Pride Month? What's your commitment to Pride Month and to the people in our community? And we'll start from my right and go on to the left. Uh, Thank you. I'm currently uh, the chairman for Ho Kanigo. It was held on the 11th to the 18th of uh, July. And uh, during the carnival, we also accommodate the community LGBTQ. Uh, we had a few issues around that uh, uh, because of what we did. Um, uh, if I knew that uh, it was around this month, I would have moved on to it. Yeah. No. I'm planning to have a, a game, maybe, to commemorate those who have 
uh, passed on because of violence, uh, because of their sexual preferences. Uh, that will be a way for me to go and to create awareness in our life building community that we need to embrace each other. Uh, regardless of uh, uh, sexual preferences in particular. Um, yeah, that's what I'm thinking to do in the quiet Monday. Okay. Um, I'm going to be uh, helping out uh, when we break with you with the, the um, rainbow leaves that we have in this year. Mm -hmm. 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 Feel free to come in and share your stories. Um, most of the, the young women in sports uh, and yes, will be coming in and out of the office uh, just because of the work that we do in collaboration. And uh, also uh, LGBTIQ people as well will be coming in to share their stories and then be going out on air and on SoundCloud as per page as well. We have a SoundCloud page at Time in Pacific if you want to listen more about LGBTIQ issues. Yeah, feel free to log in and then just listen to the audience. And also we've been uh, doing an office online. Uh, if you need anything to be posted, feel free to come in and or send in whatever you need to be posted online for the box. If you have LGBT, IQ people, women in sports, disabilities, feel free to come in and share what you need to watch. Yeah, thank you. Not, uh, for us. Um, this month we are inviting our members and we're also having get-togethers, uh, especially our women's rugby team. Yeah, we're having get-togethers. And also... And we've just received uh, funding from TIMA, so we're going to get everybody, even the grassroots uh, members. So we, we'll be beginning with, uh, we will start. Yes. Uh, and there's a little school event coming up this year called the Olympic and Paralympic Games that's happening in Paris. Yes. Kicking off next month. And this month is also the month that Olympic committees around the world celebrate Olympic Day on the 23rd of June every year. So next weekend, on Saturday the 22nd of June, there's an Olympic Day celebration. So we'll get a chance to join every national Olympic committee around the world um, to celebrate the values of sport. So there's Olympic values in friendship, excellence, and respect. And linking to the um, question about the film, there were so many values about what sport can do for individuals, for families, um, for nations, uh, through games and through competition, but so many more um, deeper messages around values that we learned tonight. So I'd like to encourage everyone to bring your families, come down to Albert Park, um, I think it's the 7 a.m. till 12, on Saturday the 22nd of June. This is an event hosted by FASANOP, the Fiji Association of Sports and National Olympic Committee. Um, it's free. Uh, there's also an event in Nandi, so if you've got colleagues, friends and family in Nandi at the same time. Um, and I can't remember the name of the ground in Nandi, the camp compound in Nandi, Saturday the 22nd. There will be a lot of different sports stations that everyone can come and try. So we talked about how important it is for people to have that safe, fun, inclusive opportunity to try a lot of different sports. This is one of those opportunities next week. Thank you very much to our panelists and this was just giving a huge round of applause. Hi everyone. Um, so I'm just a simple housewife uh, in Dano. Ah, <laughs> and I was uh, so beautifully invited by my friend Noshad, and I'm so grateful. 
And my question is, um, after a personal experience with my son, so I've got three children, and uh, all of them are really good at school and sports, actually. And I don't know how to say this, it's so uncanny that I came to them, because they end up having a joke about a certain child um, acting a bit queer. And, and so, you know, my son Elijah was trying to push him into saying that I need to be a little bit more boyish, you know, so you can run with the team. <laughs> so I see there's a lot of support and things going on for adults. Now, how many of us are going to guarantee that some of these children will make it? Um, growing up, uh, we've seen a high rate of suicides and things for all kinds of reasons. And I wouldn't guess, I, I, mean, I wouldn't leave this as an issue out of children not being able to make it because they have difficulty in participating. Um, and so as we see in the code games and the zones, it's all boys, girls, boys or girls. And so I'm, I'm sure the identity crisis is already there from that young age. Believe me, I'm a staunch, um, I won't say staunch, but I'm a pretty much straight believer in Christianity and whatnot. And I believe, you know, the Pacific Island has this. But as a mom, when I look at it as just being children or that just breaks my heart. And I'm just wondering, with all these discussions happening, it's always centered on people who have gone past a certain age, perhaps, and they're only in their adulthood life. But what about children? So, just, just my question, because I, I had to talk with my son. I was God says, in irrelevant, okay, you just need to love them. Please do not make fun of them. I didn't know how to best do it. Honestly, I didn't know. But, this has really opened my eyes to actually say, what are we going to do about that? This is linked a little bit to what I was saying earlier, that there is no formula, um, which makes this a very individual experience for everyone and very difficult to answer that. We could be here for hours if everyone gave a perception. All I wanted to reflect on is, first of all, thank you for having the courage to say something right now that's connected to you and to your children and to their experience. My favourite part about the film was the inclusion of the character of the coach's daughter. They didn't have to do that. They could have just had the coach. But watching her experience of his relationship and him trying to change the way he did to impress her, it added a dynamic to the story that didn't it, it wouldn't have been there if they didn't include that child. <clears throat> so I think that resonated with me to what you're mentioning. <clears throat> Excuse me. Is about how we change the attitudes for the next generation coming through. We can eliminate that prejudice and stereotype um, by not recreating the, the environment of the past. And that's on everyone to be able to do. And the advocacy in that film and having that daughter, I think, was a start and has opened the conversation for us today. And hopefully that will continue in your homes, in your schools, and in your workplaces as it comes up. Yeah. Yeah, just to add on to yeah. what you said, please ask the adults that needs to, you know? Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, like you shared about the, you and your son, it is us that uh, who are the perpetrators of uh, eh? saying uh, homophobic uh, comments. And uh, yeah, I can't deny I'm, I'm, I'm one too, but uh, after engaging in so many workshops with uh, Fiji Women Crisis Center, you know, it's like I was shut in a room without windows. Eh? <laughs> And more education, you know, it's like put a window on this wall on this wall, you know. And my thoughts start to brighten up on this issue. It's not an issue, it's just that, uh, you know, because of our upbringing, we were born into it. And it is us who will make the change. Yeah, it's not the kid, but I, I really love, like you said, the, the daughter, eh? It was really encouraging. Can, can we add uh, that on, on Terry? Is it possible? <coughs> Yeah, it should be out there so that, uh, you know, it can uh, help uh, create, uh, you know, the, you know, the thought pattern needs to change. Yes. And in particular for us, 
uh, who are very uh, traditional past. Uh, yeah? mm -hmm. Thank you. So, does anyone else want to add on to that, or we are all good from the panel at this point? Set. I just wanted to add, and I think I agree with um, what they said. I think a lot of times parents are. Uh, the refusal to participate in Pride events is based on gender and sexuality and it's not about just coming together as a community and recognizing that LGBTQI people are just human beings. Um, and I think we need to sort of, I mean as much as it's hard to do, but we also need to sort of remove the labels that we identify with for us to come together as a community. And so I think also for us that are part of um, CVSOs and NGOs, we also need to look at um, creating um, programs that are age appropriate for our young kids. Because the conversation about relationships, um, anatomy, autonomy, as well as sexuality is something that they're learning quite young. And we need to be able to have conversations with them that are age appropriate, as well as something that they can go back with understanding that it's all about respect and acceptance, because at the end of the day, we're just all human beings on this planet trying to survive. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the main focus. But I think for you, ma'am, we have heaps of events that are coming up for Pride that are age appropriate for young kids. Um, we have the Pride Games, we also have um, the soiree, as well as other little events. I have to confirm with the team first. But please bring your children. Um, and also, if you feel like you need someone to support you to have these conversations, please let us know. There are representatives from Family, there's representatives from the Disability Pride Hub, as well as um, our panelists, what they represent. There's also uh, Rainbow Pride Foundation, TAG, and Pacific Sexual and Gender Diversity Network that's present. If you need help with having these conversations with your kids, let us know. We'll support you, and we'll also help with reminding kids that we're just all human beings. So I think that's fundamental. Back to you, Rob. Sorry, I want to say something. Okay, Alter? Um, just one more thing in acknowledging who's here in the room. I mentioned the Olympic Day program on Saturday, the 22nd of June. And there's a colleague from the Fiji, from Pasamok here, Lindell Fisher, who's sitting at the back of the room. So if you've got any questions or you want to know more information about the event, next Saturday in Suva or in Andy. Um, go and see Lindo or myself afterwards in my house. And we'll see you all there. Nothing. Nothing. I know I can't help it. I want to give some advice as well. As a trans person that grew up as a child, having to navigate these spaces, I also want to probably need to say, uh, maybe the elephant in the room for most of us here is, the, the, the movie in itself is a representation of some biases and stereotypes. There's a lot of hypersexualization of our lives. Yes. I cringed a lot because I'm not that kind of gay. So we also need to understand context. We're the Pacific as indigenous people. There's a lot of things that dictate how our culture evolves, how we react towards each other, the differences. So it's it's as a parent, I, I don't have children of my own, but I can boldly say I have been a house mother more than how many times I can count on my finger, mm -hmm. to young gay people who did not want to go home. I have been a house mother to all those young kids. It's a matter of nature versus nurture. Instill in your child that love must be the most important thing. Mm -hmm. All children are born different anyway. So you must raise your child to know every single person that's next to them, including the one that's going to be a little bit different than you, is exactly human. It's okay to be different. And I think that's a big responsibility as parents, as nurturers of young, beautiful lives have in this day and age. So love your children. Keep telling them that it's wrong to hate because hate is learned. Kids aren't born with it. It is the gospel we need to preach. God is the embodiment of love. And that is the only thing we need to be preaching. There's no conditioning. You can't love somebody if they're natural. God won't love you if you're feminine, when you're born male. God loves you anyway. That journey is between you and God and it's none of your business. Just love the person. 
Thank you very much. <laughs> but I thank you all for being in the room. Please, it's part that you have allies in the room. Because I can't say this enough. I know we're good at our job as advocates. But it can't do much when we know that there needs to be voices from the outside of our community that says it's okay to be like us. It's impactful, it's humongous, it's huge. When we hear a straight person tell the whole white world, they're beautiful, they're okay. What have they done to you? That's impactful. That's what we're asking. If you could make more allies of the kind of companies that you keep, you have reach, you have networks. Tell everybody that we're okay. That's change. That's a huge change for us. So thank you very much, discussants, for stirring this conversation. And thank you so much, everybody that's here, who are investing in amazing work in making people's lives better. Thank you so much. I'll pass it back to Benji. Thank you so much. Thank you, Roger, and thank you, panelists, for an amazing discussion. Thank you as well to the audience, and thank you for asking that relevant question for the time that we're currently in and the day that we're trying to navigate and journey through. I just want to take this time to give a big knuckle to the French Embassy as well as, well as the Orleans Francais. Um, for having us uh, and working with us in collaboration with the Rainbow Pride Foundation and the PSGBN, Pacific Sexual and Gender Diversity Network, in hosting our first event for Pride Season 2024, and that is um, celebrating friendships and inclusion through sports with the movie. I'm gonna try. <laughs> the shiny shrimp. So, yeah, so there was nothing shiny or shrimpy about them, but I loved it. Well, now, ladies and gentlemen, please join us uh, for a bit of uh, canopies as well as um, a light refreshment. Um, I'm not sure as to what's provided, but please enjoy yourselves. And for housekeeping, you know where the bathrooms are, smoking is outside. And try not to make a man fun. <laughs> okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your time. I pray that you will have a blessed evening and please look after yourselves and those around you. Continue to share unconditional love and know that you are loved and welcomed at our office spaces. We're not a